get going. So this lecture is all about memory management in Rust and its applications. Now you may have heard of memory management and you may be slightly concerned about memory management, but it's all okay. It's actually not that bad. So let's talk about some ideas before we dive into how specifically Rust handles memory management. So computers use memory, obviously, um, but what does that look like, right? So we're going to visualize this using a bit of a checkerboard, but in reality, this is done using circuitry that if you're a computer science major, you'll learn about in CS233, or I think, yeah, miners also take CS233. So you'll probably take uh, a computer architecture course and understand more about how this works, but for now, we're just going to keep it to the high level. So memory is basically laid out with a bunch of numbers. And so what these numbers are, are called addresses. And so they basically are a location to find memory at. So think of like your address to your home, right? There's a specific number and street name and city and zip code that tells you exactly where your home is. Same idea with memory, except it's just numbers. And so we start off with zero through nine, just like normal, but because computers like powers of two, we actually go up to 16. And the way we do that is by using letters. So we use A, B, C, D, E, and F. And so A is 10, B is 11, C is 12, D is 13, E is 14, F is 15. And so this is hexadecimal. And so it's base 16, so it goes from 0 to 15, and then it wraps back around. So if you were to put um, something, let me get a laser. Um, if you were to put something here, that would be one uh, zero. So this would be 10, except instead of actually being 10, which is A now, it would be 16. So yeah, um, basically memory is laid out in this grid pattern so that we can access it in the computer. So on top of just being laid out in this grid pattern and having these numbers associated with them, they also have, depending on, there we go. So they also go past uh, one zero and so on. There's a story behind that. Um, I'm not gonna go into why the uh, Twitch stream is titled like that, but anyway. Uh, so as you can see here, it then continues and goes up to 10, 11, 12, and so on. But remember that these are actually 16, 17, 18, and so on, just written in hexadecimal. So just kind of be aware of that when you're working with memory. If you're ever dealing with actual addresses, you'll see them written in hexadecimal. Now, in order to keep everything sort of sane, we also put 0x in front of that. And what that means is that it's not just uh, a random number. It's basically, this is of type hexadecimal. And so if you wanted to do binary, you'd do 0b and then write out the entire number in binary. If you wanted to do it in decimal, you'd do 0d and then write it out in decimal. But for our purposes, we always use hexadecimal. And so that's what you'll see for pretty much the rest of the lecture. Um, and this is what you also see in a lot of memory printouts. So let's talk about the stack. You may have heard of a very popular website called Stack Overflow. That's based on the stack that we're going to talk to talk about in another few uh, slides. But the stack in uh, memory management is actually based off of a stack data structure. So the stack data structure is pretty self-explanatory. It's like a stack. You put things on and you take things off, but it's what's known as philo, first in, last out. So the first thing you put in is going to be the last thing that you take off of the stack. And in this case, we use what's called push and pop to either put things onto the stack in the uh, case of push or take things off of the stack in the case of pop. And so when we do this, we'll be pushing things onto the stack as we go on, and then we'll be popping them off later on. So this is the stack. The best way to describe it is a stack of plates. And that's because you don't really want to remove the bottom plate in a stack of plates. You're just going to remove the top because that's the easiest way to do it. So we're going to start very early on with her first poll question. So let me start up the poll bot.
I have to remember how many answers are um, to this one. Okay, so the first question is, are stacks phi-lo, or not phi-lo, phi-fo, first in, first out? So I'll give everyone another few seconds here. All right, so it looks like most people put uh, two saying false, although some people did put one, which is true. And so the correct answer is false. And that's because remember, stacks are phi low, first in, last out, whereas we were talking about first in, first out with this one. So yeah, uh, stacks are first in, last out. So let's talk about the stack and the heap in Rust. And so the stack and the heap are parts of memory that are available to your code, but they're very differently set up. So they use different ways to control your data and are used in different circumstances. So the stack functions just like the stack data structure, but in this case is used for uh, storing data of a known and fixed size. So this is really important, right? And we'll get into why in a moment. So the heap, on the other hand, is a general term that describes basically the rest of memory. And what the rest of that memory can do is just put things into boxes. And anywhere in there, you can either add boxes, remove boxes, change what's in the boxes. And so this allows you to store data of unknown sizes or change the size of data as time goes on. So imagine the stack basically as a person sitting at a table reading your code with papers coming in. And so here we go, we have a person, right? And we now have a couple of functions. So first off, we're going to look at this main function. And so in the main function, we have let num equals three, and then we call this other function. So with the stack data structure and the stack in Rust, what we're gonna do is we're gonna read, this is function main, we're gonna say, okay, we have this number, which is three, we know it's an integer, and this goes back to that known fixed size. We cannot do things where we don't know the size, but because we know all integers have a certain size, we know that we can say, okay, this number is this many bytes. And so if we were to look at the type of this, it's probably um, an integer of 32 bits, maybe 64. And in that case, you know exactly how much memory you need on the stack for that number. And so we put that piece of paper down because we saw that other function is called. And so for other funct, we're now going to say, okay, what is in here? And we see let other num equal to five. So we're gonna get a new piece of paper. We're gonna write down other funct and we're gonna write down five. And once again, we know other num is a, si a size that we know because it's an integer. So we can put it on the sheet of paper. Now, we, if we had any more lines of code, we would actually put them in and we would be doing more work with them. But because we don't, we're going to tear up that piece of paper. We're done with this function. All of that memory is free now and we are done with this function. So we're gonna go back, we're gonna take a look at our original piece of paper and we're gonna say, okay, cool, what else do we need to do? And in this case, we don't have anything else we need to do. So now that we're done executing the main function, we're also gonna tear that up and the stack is now free of our program in Rust. So what about elements that we don't know the size of, right? The answer is the heap. So in this case, right, instead of a integer, we're looking at a string and we're using string from. And what's important about string from is that we don't know the size of that string that we're creating, right? And we can also change it, right? If I wanted to append world to hello, and make it hello world, I would be changing the size because I'm adding new data to that variable. So this is very important because this is where things get a little bit crazy is because you now have to deal with two different places where your memory is. Whereas in Python, you're going to only have the one and it's abstracted away from you. Well, you'll have the two, but you won't notice them. Anyway, 
So in this case, right, if we tried to allocate to the stack, we don't know, right? We don't know if it's hello, we don't know if it's hello world, we don't know how big it's gonna be. So instead, what we're gonna do is we're going to open up the heap, which in this case, we're going to use a metaphor that they're called lockers. And so each of these lockers is going to be one set of data. So now over here, we now know that we have um, a string and we're going to put the hello into each of these lockers. So we put H, E, L, L, and O into the locker. And we now have this data somewhere in the heap. And now on the stack, what we're gonna do is we are actually going to put a set of data. And so you'll see here, we have three things. We have a pointer, we have a length, and then we have a capacity. So what's interesting about this is that you notice we still have a flexible amount of data because now we can just put things in the next locker over whenever we need to add memory. However, looking at this actual piece on the heap, or on the stack, sorry, if we look at the string on the uh, stack, you'll notice we have a pointer, len, and capacity. And what's important about these is that they're all of a fixed size. So even though the variable isn't fixed size, we actually have a fixed size piece in the stack. And by doing that, we have a pointer, which is basically going to give us this address. So it might be 0x1001050 or something. And the point being is that that is where that data is held in memory, and that's always a fixed size, so we know exactly how much data we need. Then we have len, which is going to be an integer telling us how big it is, and capacity, and these are kind of arbitrary, but you get the point, right? We have data that is associated with it that we always know is a certain size. So let's go on to our next poll question. So in this case, we're asking the stack in Rust holds data of, and then what type or what size? All right, I'll let the poll settle down for another few seconds here. Okay, I'm closing up the poll. All right, so it looks like everyone put three. And so three is the correct answer. Remember, they have to be a known fixed size. So the first one is wrong because it's not fixed. The second one, we don't know the size. The third one is correct. And then the fourth one, it's a fixed size, but we don't know how big it is, which is not what we want. So let's take all these individual pieces that we've been putting together so far and all of these concepts and let's actually put them into real Rust code that we can look at. So to do that, we have to talk about ownership. And so Rust has a very, has a concept of ownership. And so ownership is this idea that each value in Rust has a variable that owns it. And so every piece of memory in the heap has an owner. Also, there can only be one owner of any piece of data at a time. So the first one is pretty obvious, right? You have something in the stack that holds your data in the heap, and then you have your data in the heap and they need to be linked. That makes sense. Now the second one might seem weird, right? Why can't we just access two piece, the same data in two different places? And the reason is because this makes multi-threading safe. And that is really, really important because otherwise, you're gonna run into countless issues later on. And then finally, when the owner goes out of scope, the value is going to be dropped and the memory is going to be cleared out both on the stack and the heap. So you need to make sure that whenever you're dealing with ownership and memory on the heap, that you're aware of when things are going out of scope because all that memory will get deleted. So let's take a look at some Rust code. So we say let x equals five, pretty self-explanatory. We've seen that before, that goes on the stack. But then we have let y equals x, right? And what happens here? Well, in this case, we make x and then we make a copy of it and bind it to y. And so this works because the values are a fixed size, because we know exactly how much memory 
we can put it on the stack and it's no problem. So as a result, both y and x will now contain 5. However, let's try that with a string. Now, we already talked about how a string from hello is going to be put onto the heap. So what do you think will happen when we put it on it, or when we try to make a copy of it using this syntax? And feel free to put an answer in the chat if you want. Okay, um, so it doesn't look like anyone wanted to put anything in the chat, that's fine. So in this case, we have S1, which is a string, and what we're doing, so Afnan is correct, we are going to take the string, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna say S2 is now the new owner of the data in S1. And so it's not going to be the same because the value's on the heap. So if we look at this graphically, right, if we have a move operation, which is what this equal sign is, instead of making more data and then putting it on the heap, what we're going to do instead is we're going to say, instead of S1 having this data, we are now going to clear out S1, say it's invalid, and tell the compiler that so that we can't make any mistakes with S1. And then we're gonna point the S2 pointer to the data that S1 used to point to. And so this moves the data from S1 to S2. And this is so that we don't have two owners of the same data. So that is a really important concept because let's say we didn't do that. Um, I missed which slides are where. So instead, let's talk about how to fix the solution or fix this and do what we wanted to do, right? So if you wanted to copy, instead what you're gonna do is you're going to have a string from hello. Uh, so owners are just references like in Java. Yes, so sort of. Um, basically, the owner, there can only be one. So when you connect this to this, there can only be one owner of data at one time. Whereas in Java, you can, I'm pretty sure I haven't done Java in a long time, is you can actually have multiple references to the same data in the heap. Although, once again, I haven't done Java in a while and I also cannot guarantee that because I never dealt with memory to that level. But basically, when it comes to Java, uh, think of this data as basically a reference, yeah. But keep in mind that you wanna think about this in Rust because ownership is completely unique to Rust. And so yes, using S1 is not allowed after that. So S1, because it used to be the owner, can not use the data because it no longer owns this data. So it no longer has access to this data because it doesn't own it, right? And this is to prevent anyone from accidentally reading that data while we're doing anything with threading. And so if you wanted to copy and have S1 still be able to use the data, what you need to do is you need to let S1 equal string just like before, and then you need to use the dot clone function. And what this dot clone function is gonna do is it's going to allow you to basically take the data that was in S1 and put it somewhere else in memory. And so in some cases, that'll be right next door and it'll be in this locker and then go down here. Some places it'll be like way in a different spot in memory and it really depends. So in this case, you can see we went from 0x0 to 0xA and so we haven't moved that far, but sometimes it could be way in a different place in memory depending on your system. And so We'll talk about that a little bit, but the short answer to is.clone applicable to all data types is yes, until you make your own. And so if you start building your own class or struct, and I'm pretty sure those are covered in Rust 3, those will need, you'll need to define a clone function because otherwise it doesn't know exactly what needs to be cloned in memory. So why do this, right? Why use the clone function? Well, as we said, we need to keep ownership in mind. If we pointed both of these things here, that's gonna be bad because there can only be one owner at a time and when an owner goes out of scope, the value is gonna be dropped. And so if you were to do this, right, now you have a problem because when you reach the S2 uh, equals S1 line, now what's going, or when you try and read this data and all of a sudden start reading the data and writing the data, because let's say you have these on two separate threads now. 
If S1 is writing data and maybe replacing this with world, but S2 is reading it and expecting hello, all of a sudden you're going to have a problem because instead of deleting it like normal, we now don't know what's in there, right? And so if we were to try and read from S2, I, we could have an issue. And so this also means that if S1 went out of scope, as you can see in, in three here, when we try to have S2 either go out of scope or try and read from it, we're going to have lots of problems. And so this is really, really bad. And so the ownership system allows us to avoid these issues by saying there can only be one owner. So we know it's safe to delete this memory when we want to. And so you'll notice that this is a lot more complex and has a bunch of different rules than say something like C++. However, as great as C++ is allowing you to access that memory directly and not putting these rules into place, it also means that if a human makes a mistake somewhere along the line, it's going to be much harder to find that mistake. And so what Rust does is it makes development a little bit slower because you have to follow the rules and you're going to run into more compiler issues. But in the long run, it will make it much, much faster because you won't have to deal with very hard to find bugs later on. So let's talk about our next poll question. So when transferring data of an unknown size, such as a string, Rust will copy the data, true or false? All right, I'll give everyone another second. Okay. So it looks like everyone put two, and so two is the correct answer. It is false. And as we talked about, this is because we don't know that, like we don't know the size. We, we actually might get to unsafe rust. I don't know for sure. I can't remember the schedule. I don't remember if it's on there, and if it's not, that might be something that I want to throw in for a lecture. So we might talk about unsafe rust. Um, we'll see depending on time. So let's talk about ownership in the context of functions. So functions are going to take ownership of the variables that you pass in them unless you tell it otherwise. And so this is really, really important because if the value is stored on the heap, it's going to take ownership and you might run into issues. So let's take a look at that. So here we have some code and I know this is like a wall of text, but we're gonna run through it line by line. So we start off here by saying S is a string from hello, just like normal. But remember that this is on the heap now. So now we are going to print that string. And so this function takes a string and it takes ownership. So this is really, really important. And this is where ownership can cause a lot of issues if you're not careful and if you're not used to something like Rust. And so what's going to happen here is print string is actually going to take ownership and take some string and make s some string and so str and string with a capital s aren't the same and i can give a more accurate answer after lecture but the general short answer is that i believe str is a set of characters and then string with a capital s is an object with an array of characters or something like that i i can do much better research and figure it out uh, if I just take a look at the docs. When, when in doubt, look at the docs for Rust. They will give you all the answers, but I'll give a better answer after lecture. So going back to this code, we have uh, let x equal five. And so we've already done string, but now we're gonna do print num. Well, actually, sorry, um, I forgot which does which. So print string is going to take ownership of s and it's going to print, but then some string which is now s or s which is now some string is going to go out of scope after print string is done so when this happens s is no longer valid because not only did print string take ownership but on top of that it's now gone out of scope so it's not even in memory if we had a way to access it again so as you can see yeah we transferred ownership to some string and because ownership was not returned it goes out of scope and is deleted so now let's look at this function. 
right? We say x is equal to five, is five, and because it's a fixed size, we can now pass it in to print number, which is going to take a fixed size number, and rather than pass, move the data and take ownership, it's just going to copy the data because it's just an integer. And so you can see data from x is copied into some integer, and then it simply takes the data and prints it out. Now, the reason for this, because this looks like a super nuanced question, and it's like, well, why not just take ownership of the variable for x as well? The reason is because x, for simplicity's sake, is so small and so easy to move, or so easy to copy, that we can just copy it, and it really doesn't add that much to performance. However, if we look at something like print string up here, what if this were, say, an object for a database and it had, say, a thousand records in it, right? That, if you just do the function calls a couple of times and you're copying that data every single time, imagine how much performance you're going to lose. So it's really important that we're able to move this data instead because we're going to save significant amounts of time, especially where performance is really key on larger objects. So let's talk about ownership in the function or in the context of functions, right? Functions can also give ownership. So just like they can take ownership, we can give it back. So in this first example, right, it will give us ownership of an object, so or of data. So in this case, right, we say this function gives us a string, and so we create a string of an unknown size, and then we return it. And so this ownership, this data gets returned, and then the ownership goes up to S1. So now S1 owns the data, and we no longer have access to it down here, but because the ownership has been passed back up and is no longer in some string, when some string gets popped off the stack, because that data has already been given to another owner, some string is no longer going to delete the data in this hello. However, if we look at this next example, S2, where we have a string called hello, and we pass it in to takes and gives back, what this is going to do is it's going to take ownership of a string and then it's just going to return it back. Now, in reality, we could modify it, we could capitalize it, we could print out whatever, but in this case, we're just taking that ownership and we're sending it right back. And so now you can see S2 becomes invalid because S2 lost ownership and S3 now has the data. And so here's the thing, right? This works, but it's really tedious, right? Imagine if you had to give ownership back every single time and it can get messy, right? If we look at this example, if I just want to return the string uh, or return the size of a string and I want to return that ownership, I have to create the string, I have to pass the ownership in, and then inside I have to create the length and then return the length. But now I can't return the ownership to the string. So I'd either have to clone it or do something else and this is going to become a really big pain. And so this, if I had to do this when I was writing Rust, I would just never write Rust. This would be absurdly difficult and annoying and tedious and just, it adds complexity where complexity doesn't need to be. However, Rust has, or actually, so in order to fix this issue of returning ownership to S1, here's a solution, right? We can put in a tuple and we can put in the variable that we have got ownership from from above, and then we can return the length. And so now we have a tuple, but now we have a tuple, we need to destructure it. It's just causing a bunch of issues. So comparatively, rather than doing this messy fix that like only kind of works, Rust gives us a solution instead. So yeah, as I said, if I needed to do this every time, I'd never write Rust code. It would just be too difficult and annoying and pointless. So instead, let's talk about borrowing. And so what borrowing is, is it is the way that you can go about taking data and returning it back. So looking at this function, you're going to see, just like normal, we have let s1 equal string, and then we say let the length of that string equal calculate length, and then in here we have the same function from before, and then we print out just like before. There's one difference though, and that difference, some of the eagle-eyed among you might have spotted, is the ampersand. So as you can see, we have a couple of ampersands. And so what this allows us to do is it's allowing us to take a reference and instead of getting ownership, we're able to borrow the data. So 
instead of saying S1 no longer exists and then just being done with it, what we can do is we can pass S1 in, but in this function signature, you can see we have this ampersand which tells Rust, hey, I want this data back when I'm done, right? Just like if you were to give a friend a book or your phone or whatever, you'd want that data back just um, the same. So this ampersand tells Rust, hey, you can borrow this data from me, but give it back when you're done and don't destroy it. And so that allows us to get this data, get the length and return the length. But then when this function's done, we're able to send that data back to S1 and S1 becomes the owner again. And so S1 never really loses ownership, but what's happening in the background, I think this is somewhere, maybe not. Um, basically what's happening is instead of S1 uh, giving ownership, the S here points to S1 and then S1 points to the data. So keep in mind, these references are read only. And so in real life, if someone borrowed your phone, book, whatever, and they change it, right? If they like wrote their name in the book, you probably wouldn't be very happy. And so someone asked, is this different from C++ pointers? Yes. So what this does is this ampersand, basically the only difference is it's not giving ownership of data. So instead of actually dealing with uh, going into here, so as you see here, right? If we go back a couple slides, you'll notice we call s.len just the same as we do when we borrow it, right? And so the only difference that's happening in the background is Rust now knows that when it's destroying the data in S, to not actually destroy the data, but just destroy S and let S1 keep ownership of it. And so ownership never leaves S1 and S just points to S1. And so I can actually, if I grab a piece of paper here, One more second. Okay, so we're going high tech tonight. We're using paper. So what's happening in my is if I create the locker like before, and I put it in. Sorry, I know uh, you can't see this yet, but we're almost there. Okay, so here's what's happening in memory. Let me see. I might have to make my video a little bit bigger here. I know, production quality. We're going old school. I do not have high tech today. Okay, so let me make my camera way bigger. Um, almost there. In the meantime, you can take a look. Okay, here we go. There we go. Uh, that's upside down. Nope, that was right side up the first time. Is it mirrored? No. Okay, we're good. So as you can see here, uh, my finger's on it though. Okay, so as you can see, we have hello and data. And then what happens is we say S1 now is the owner of this data. However, we also keep, wow, this is really hard to do backwards. Um, so S now is pointing to S1 and then S1 says, hey, here's my data. So S is borrowing this data from S1 but S1 always remains the owner the entire time. So I hope that helps. Let's go back here. Okay, uh, that's very much my bad. Uh, I should have thought that through, putting a piece of paper right up to the camera that was not ready to do that. Okay, uh, hopefully you saw that. Let me try that again. I'm gonna hold it a little bit further away. Um, Okay, here we go. So the data right here, this data, S1 is the owner, and then S points to S1, and then S1 will give it that data. But when S gets destroyed, yeah, I can see how the paper noise is annoying. Uh, when S gets destroyed, now S1 is still the owner, the only thing that changed is S got destroyed. Okay, perfect. Sorry about the paper noises. Um, yeah, my bad. Okay, so 
that is borrowing uh, for a simple example. But so notice if we try and push data into it, so let's say we try and change the string, it's going to cause an error. And that's because some string is immutable because some string doesn't actually own this data. And that's because as we talked about, it's borrowing the data. If you wrote, like if I were to give you my amazing piece of paper that totally isn't a noise issue, if I were to give you this piece of paper, I wouldn't want it back if all of a sudden I have all this writing on it, right? I gave you that piece of paper hoping that you could borrow it, but all of a sudden it comes back with plenty of writing on it, that's an issue. So instead, just like in, just like in real life, when you borrow something, you need to return it without changing it. So in this case, we say, okay, some string, we try and push to it, but this is gonna give an error because some string cannot be changed because it's being borrowed. However, there is a loophole. What if I gave you that piece of paper by saying, hey, you can change this however you want. I don't want it back, or I want it back, but feel free to change it however you want. And so in that case, you can do whatever you want with it. So to do that, instead of just putting an ampersand, we put ampersand mut. And just like before, we have a mutable string and we can just put and mutable and then inside here and mute and then inside we can do whatever now. And so this is completely fine, no issues at all. We're now able to work with the strings. And so here's the thing. This is true, but you can either have one mutable reference or any number of immutable references, but you can't have both, right? You can't have your cake and eat it too. That's too much things going on at once. So you can either choose to take this mutable string and pass it in and borrow it and use it in a couple places and no issue, right? Because the original owner is the only one that can change this data. And so as a result, we know that nowhere else it's going to try and read it and run into, into an issue. However, if we give the mutability somewhere else, right? If we say let R3 equal uh, this um, data, it's going to become a problem because now these two borrowed ones are now working with this borrowed one, but this borrowed one can also change things. And so that's really bad because we don't want the other borrowing to now have two different locations where it can be changed and get very, very badly confused. So as a result, you can only have mutable references for one at a time, right? You can only have one at a time or you can have multiple non-mutable references. So let's go to the poll questions. And I think this is the one that we start having more of them. So let me do that. Okay, so here's the first question we are going to ask. We have this function here. So we have a function, example function, then we have a couple different types. A is what, B is what, and C is what. And so this one might take a little bit of time to read through. Okay, it looks like everyone has their answers in. I'm going to close the bot. Okay, so it looks like most people put three and then a few people put two. And so the correct answer is three. And so let's go through why that is. So if we look at this example, right? So A is a string. And so notice that this is a string with a capital S, which means that it can, uh, it's an unknown size. So as a result, we're transferring ownership into this example function. It now is the owner because it's an unknown 
unfixed size variable. So A is now transferred the ownership and wherever you pass this in from is no longer the owner. B, however, is going to take in a read-only borrow. So remember, this is the single ampersand, so it's going to borrow the data from wherever you pass in from B, and so it now has that data, but the data ownership is going to go back up to whatever variable B passed in uh, beforehand. And then finally we have C, and so C is and mute, so C will actually be able to be changed inside example function, but it's also going to have its ownership transferred back up. So these are the three different types that we've talked about, and so this is a really good point if you have any questions about any of these three to put them in because we are going to move on to the next poll question in a second. All right, final call for questions on this one. Okay. So the next question is, we can have as many immutable references as we want. All right, take another few seconds to finish up your answers. All right, I'm going to close the poll. Okay, so that is a fair point. Someone said that this uh, that they felt this was a trick question. You're not wrong. This is sort of a trick question, but it's the most uh, it's the most logical answer. So most people put that this is true. Let me just double check that I'm not wrong on that. Yeah. So most people put true, and that's correct. We can have as many immutable references as we want, and so this might have been a good place for me to put in my trick question from last week of maybe. And that's because we can have as many mutable, immutable references as we want whenever we have no mutable references. Sort of. So be careful with that terminology. Um, yeah, three all of the above from last week would have been a good choice. But uh, unfortunately, I did not want to do that again. So uh, yeah. As long as we have the, as long as the owner of the memory is good and we only have immutable references, we can have as many as we want. We can make a for loop that makes like infinite amounts. So let's ask the same question about mutable references. All right, I'll give it another few seconds. All right, I am going to close the poll. All right, so it looks like the bandwagon effect of PollBot might have uh, happened this time because uh, everyone put true, or not at true, false, sorry, everyone put false. And so that is the correct answer. We can only have one mutable reference. And so the reasoning for that is, as we said, we don't want to be able to change data in two places at once. Now let's ask the final question for tonight.
Also, I know I might sound like a broken record with this, but this is some of the most important parts of Rust when it comes to making easy bugs and other issues that you may run into. Alright, I'll give everyone another few seconds. Alright, I'm going to close the poll. Okay, so it looks like most people put true, um, a few people put false. So the correct answer is, let me just double check because, yeah, so the correct answer is false. I'm not exactly sure why people put true, but so let's, I guess, recover this because this is really important. So going back to this slide, remember we can either have one mutable reference or any number of immutable references but they can't happen at the same time so we can have as many immutable references and a, a single mutable reference but if we do it at the same time it is as you can see in this comment a big problem so make sure that when you're doing this you are only using immutable references or immutable borrowing or you only have one uh, borrow so yeah, this one's a really important one. So uh, it is interesting that a lot of people put true on that one. Uh, I'm slightly interested as to whether that was a bandwagon effect with Polbot, but we'll have to see. Um, so yeah, in terms of this one, this is really, really important. It is not true because you can only have one mutable reference or any number of immutable references at one time. So let's also talk about dereferencing for a little bit. Uh, this is the last main topic. So reference variables are stored in memory. And so as we talked about, we have S and S1, and S1 actually points to data. And so this is how we were looking at it before in my amazing drawing on that piece of paper. And so this is all great, but in case we want to deal with anything else, right? How do we get from S to this data? And so this is really important in some bigger objects. What you're going to do is you're actually going to dereference by using this star. And so what this star does is it says, oh, I borrowed a mutable integer, but an integer is data that could have been copied. So I guess I'm just going to do nothing with it. That's not what you want to do. So instead what you're going to do is you're going to tell it, hey, this is actually a reference to the data. This isn't actually the data. So go and find the actual data by dereferencing using that star and then add five to it. And so that way you're able to change this number and not have to create a function where you're returning the, no the number or anything like that. And then you can print out just like normal. So why don't we need to dereference in previous examples? Because in some case Rust will automatically do it for you. This one's pretty self-explanatory, but I, uh, it's basically just Rust is a really nice compiler that will handle a lot of that for you, which is very nice. So why do we need to do all of this? Rust seems hard, right? Rust seems like a lot of work. Why are we doing all of this work? Well, because of memory and performance. That is the short answer. The long answer is that we have this trade-off where we can either choose to have great performance or great speed or we have to come to a compromise in the middle or sorry great safety or great speed right we can write really really fast programs but it's going to be very easy to make mistakes or we can write really really quick programs that are super easy to write but they won't run as fast so let's talk about the example that a lot of people ask why don't i just do this in java or java or um, python so what does java do Java uses a garbage collector. So a garbage collector will periodically scan through all of your memory and it will go through all of the memory and it'll say, hey, are you still being used? And if not, it's going to free it. It's going to delete that memory and it's gone. And so all the work is done for you. This is why you don't have to deal with it in Java. And this is why when someone asked earlier about how similar it is to Java, I wasn't quite sure because I just usually knew that the garbage collector would take care of it. 
So the garbage collector is great because you don't have to do anything. However, just like this big truck, the garbage collector is very, very, very slow. The garbage collector is going to take a lot of time. Also, I know we are out of time, but I have three slides left, so just bear with me. Um, the garbage collector is basically going to scan your entire memory and it's going to take forever. So why doesn't every language do it, right? And as I said, it's because it's very, very slow. However, comparatively, we have other languages like this, and this is also a very, very uh, skewed chart. This isn't very accurate, but it's, it's sort of the idea. So what you'll see here is you have this trade-off that I mentioned of performance versus safety. So you can either have really, really safe languages like Haskell, but they're not going to be as performant as something like C or C++, where the programmer handles a lot of things like memory. And then Rust is kind of out here because Rust gives us the control and performance of C and C++ by actually allowing us to use all the memory tricks that C and C++ are, but it gives us safety by actually handling a lot of that for us so that we don't have to deal with that. And so that's what's really great about Rust is it gives us both the performance and the safety to make our lives easier. So the question is, well, can you just use Python for everything if you don't like this? The short answer is no. When you go out into the real world, you're likely going to be dealing with uh, a job where you might have to write some really efficient code or it's going to go out into production and you want to make sure that your user has a good experience and you want to make sure that you minimize resources or you might be working on a uh, research application that takes up uh, plenty of time to run on a quantum computer or something like that. In those cases, you don't want to be using something like Python because the time for the running is very, very expensive and it might impact user experience or whatever. So instead, we want to write really, really fast code and really performant code that is in something like Rust or C++ or something else like that. And we do so because we want to make sure that we're writing as efficient code as possible, as easily as possible. And that's where Rust comes into play. So hopefully that made a lot of sense. If you have any questions, I'm probably just going to stick around in one of the Office Hours Discord rooms for people to ask conceptual questions because I know uh, the bar uh, borrowing system is somewhat confusing and memory management is very new to freshmen. So don't worry if you have any more questions, I'll head over to Office Hours in a minute. But otherwise, that was borrowing and memory management in Rust and... Hopefully you have a good time with Rust 3, which is going to be, I'm actually not quite sure, but we're going to have a Rust 3 soon. And after that, we're going to dive into some deeper topics with Rust. But other than that, that was the lecture today, and I hope everyone has a good weekend.